Ladies and gentlemen, we are live on the air here with uh, a fellow climate denier, Mark Morano. He's the executive director of, what is it, Climate Depot? ClimateDepot.com, yes. Yeah, there it is. And uh, we've got him on the show. It's an honor and a privilege to have you on here. Tell our listeners a little bit about what you've been doing the last five or 10 years and uh, how you got into all this. Well, yeah, for the last five, I, I used to work in the United States Senate Environment and Public Works Committee as a senior staffer, as a director of communications, speechwriter. And in 2009, I left to start Climate Depot. But what I did in the Senate Environment Public Works is we fought the battle of global warming. I was working there when Al Gore's movie came out. I was working there when the, the UN 2007 report came out. They won the Nobel Peace Prize. I was there when Obama was elected and, and, and tried to shove his cap and trade climate program through Congress. Uh, I worked with, for uh, Senator James Inhofe, who's now deceased earlier, I guess last month in July, who led the battle. He was the man who stood up against all the other Republican senators and said, no, we're not going to allow this. And we're not going to just talk about the economic costs. We're going to talk about the scientific absurdity of all of this. The idea that the government can tax and regulate the earth's temperature and hurricanes and floods, uh, similar to witchcraft. And it was an honor to work with him. And I collected, spearheaded, uh, and I was the author of the thousand dissenting scientists uh, who stand against the consensus, including Ivy League, MIT, um, uh, uh, and uh, 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 NASA scientists, former Nobel Peace Prize winning scientists, Princeton scientists. And we compiled that list in their own words. It was the shot heard around the world. I first came out of the list 2000 and, um, 2000 and late 2007. And that was the beginning, I think, of the organized, certainly through the United States uh, government. We had a senator leading this charge, fighting back against this madness. Prior to that, I'd been an investigative reporter. Prior to that, I'd done a, a documentary. It came out in year 2000 on the Amazon rainforest, which was the environmental scare before this. And now they all admit the rainforest is is no longer, you know, the deforestation rates are way down. The New York Times now admits for every acre of rainforest cut, 50 are being regenerated. People are leaving the jungles and swamps. We're supposed to call them rainforests, though, and moving to urban areas. Uh, so I've devoted my career since like 1992, when I started working for Rush Limbaugh, the television show, to debunking environmental scares. And that's what led me to this. My book is The Politically Incorrect Guide to Climate Change. That came out in 2018. 2021, I had green fraud, why the Green New Deal is worse than you think. My most recent book, 2022, is uh, excuse me, The Great Reset, Global Elites and the Permanent Lockdown. And that's detailing how they're fusing climate change into a public health threat. And the idea there is to um, make it so that your local public health official can now decree that driving a gas powered car, eating meat, traveling too much, setting your thermostat too low in the summer is can now be a public health threat to the community. And we have they have lawyers now suing energy companies, basically saying you are the cause of that flood in Louisiana or that you know her, tornado in Tornado Alley in Oklahoma. And we've just reached peak absurdity in this whole climate debate. And they're now trying to turn it public health existential threat. 200 medical journals are saying climate change is a public health emergency. The World Health Organization is all in on this. We have doctor toolkits. Your doctors will now ask you about your carbon footprint. I mean, it, and the hospitals have gone green in recent times. They're, you I even down to the surgeons scrubbing up for an operation, how you can cut water use uh, in order to get your green certification. It's frightening stuff. And it's just run amok. And it's not done through uh, elections. That's the most shocking. It's done through corporate government collusion, the deep state and executive orders and every cabinet agency being a climate agency. Well, that, that's an, an amazing summation of everything going on right now. Uh, and they are, this is all being forced on the public. It is yes. corrupt, corruption at the highest level. Let's talk about this, uh, this graph here, climate in court. Uh, it, you know, prior to 2000, yeah. there was none of this going on. And the absurdity on what's happening in the United States and non-U.S. countries is amazing. And this is all about... A, tra a trace gas that humans only maybe uh, contribute 4% annually to on Earth. 
Yes, uh, there, there's a whole organization called 350.org. We're currently at around 430 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. Just so you understand, if you put on a COVID mask and start breathing, I think it, I think it gets up to almost 30,000 parts per million that you're breathing back in. Uh, and, and on uh, you know, submarines, other things, they have, I think it's 40,000 parts per million. CO2 is not a pollutant. It's not a danger to human health. There are hundreds of factors that influence the climate. Carbon dioxide is but one. We had warmer temperatures in the medieval warm period. We had warmer temperatures in the Roman warming period. And this is documented peer review. And my book, The Politically Incorrect Guide to Science, I devote a whole chapter to the whole historical data. And I always quote mainstream sources. I have the New York Times admitting, excuse me, their Dot Earth reporter, Andrew Revkin at the time, saying the climate activists aren't going to like this study, showing like the medieval warm period was warmer than today. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is you'll hear about the hottest year on record. All these claims are based on a global average temperature, which invents temperatures that don't exist. They use climate models. They mix this all together into this sort of uh, brew, and then they claim all of these things. But if you, if you strip away all that propaganda, Joe Biden's EPA still shows the 1930s heat waves as seven, 10 times worse based on the EPA heat wave index than anything we're currently experiencing. 75% of all state high temperature records were broken in the United States before 1955. There's no trend globally in hurricanes, floods, tornadoes, wildfires, droughts. And you can look at that at 30 year, 50 year, 100 year cycles. We're reduced to Biden's EPA saying heat waves are worse since 1960. Look at these charts and they show heat waves going up. It's like, gee, the same data source and on the next page, shows you that the 1930s were much higher and, they, and then they cooled to the 1960s and then they've come up very slightly. There's still 1930s reign supreme, but that's how you get your climate emergency is they start, they pick a start date. What was 1960? One of the colder periods of the 20th century leading into the 1970s ice age scare. This is the nonsense that you showed that chart of the lawsuits. One last point on that. They are recruiting elementary school kids as young as eight, middle school kids, high school kids, 60 Minutes is profiling it. Uh, environmental groups, governments. You know, they're suing governments in the United States and state governments. They're suing European governments for failing to secure children's climate future. In other words, they want these governments to go full Marxist in order to change the weather to save the kids so that they'll have help to have a, a more prosperous future. Keep in mind, the last 100 years has been a 99% drop in climate related deaths. Why? Technology, innovation, wealth creation, and of course, early warning for tornadoes and hurricanes, satellites, radar. But most importantly, it's the development that wealth has fueled. We have better infrastructure. We can withstand that. And of course, the weather's not getting more extreme, no matter what they take. Another trick they do there is they'll pick Western California and this region since 2004, the droughts have increased this much. If they continue, it'll be a desert by the year 2100. And it's like, I'm sorry, if you look at the history of California and mainstream, again, everything I do is mainstream sources. San Jose Mercury News goes back a couple centuries and shows the droughts much, much worse in California. You'll hear about wildfires. Wildfires, first of all, are a terrible measure of climate change because wildfires uh, have to do with political land use, have to do with development, have to do with water, irrigation, tree and forestry policy. And even accounting for all of that, wildfires are down dramatically, both globally and in the United States over the last hundred years. There, there's just no there there. Everything they do is a con. It's all yep. designed to get you to support net zero, a great reset, climate uh, regulations on your life. And just the last point, this is the intentional collapse of our energy supply, rationing of energy, intentional collapse of our food supply. They're coming after food in multiple ways. Number one, you got the private equity firms buying up. You have Bill Gates, number one farmland owner in the U.S., followed closely by Jeff Bezos, followed closely by China, followed. And then, and, and of course, uh, for years, people like Ted Turner have been involved in buying up lands. But here's the key with food. They're coming after nitrogen based fertilizer, which gives you high yield agriculture, saying that the nitrous oxide is, is a warming agent that has to be regulated. And they're coming directly after meat by coming after methane. Methane, of course, is what cows fart out and belch. And that is, that's what John Kerry said. The American farmers are now going to come under this. European farmers, they tried to do. The Netherlands revolted. Other countries wide, you know, they lost a huge election in the EU. The Greens did because of the farmer-led agriculture. They were spraying manure 
on the gates of hell or otherwise known as the EU headquarters in Brussels. So that's happening. And then of course, transportation, and this is key. Ration your travel. CNN just proposed carbon passports monitored by the government to limit your travel. In a declared climate emergency, you can't just pick up and travel. You have to justify to a government agent. Why are you going to the beach? You're going for a funeral to Florida. We might be able to let it slide, but if you're going for another vacation, you've already exceeded your carbon budget. They're also coming after gas powered cars, rationing vehicles, a la Cuba, a la East Germany, where we, we actually had the government the, under Eric Honecker in the 1980s. You could only have one car. The government approved uh, East German Trabant, which was crappy. You had to be on waiting list five, 10 plus years. Now the United States government is saying the same thing along with corporate government collusion. You can only have one car, an electric car, as we ration uh, gas powered cars. And one last point, I'm sorry, I keep saying one last point, but this is all related to what the emergency decrees, if you look back at COVID, we had the most consequential decisions of our life imposed on us without an ounce of democracy. Public health officials could declare an emergency. Uh, the United States government declared a public health emergency. And you had the CDC telling renters they couldn't evict. You had churches closed. You had weddings and funerals canceled. You had medical procedures canceled. You had kids staying at home. You had stay at home orders by governors. You had vaccine mandates, mask mandates. All what? Are you ready for this? Without a single vote anywhere. Um, of anyone supporting that. It was imposed upon us. And then fast forward, what's happening with gas powered cars? US Congress never voted on it. State, le even California, this, the ground zero never voted to ban gas powered cars. It's happening to unelected bureaucrats and then imposed upon us. And that is what's happening. And that is really what the Great Reset is. It's turning the one free West into a Chinese style, one, one party authoritarian state. And that is why you see people, including Governor Tim Walls of Minnesota, loving China, some 30 some trips, praising China, Apple CEO, praising China and their values align. You had New York Times columnist Tom Friedman saying that he, he admires China's one party dictatorship. Justin Trudeau exactly said the exact same thing, how it gets things done without the messiness of democracy. This is the world in which we live. Our ruling class elite want to turn us into the one party rule and they're well on their way. Yeah. So uh, what do we do? I mean, the facts are, you and I point out the facts and you talked yeah. a lot of, about them. The fact that there's no increase in severe weather and, and stuff like this, where you can get the information publicly. I mean, the largest wildfires we've seen in the last few years are all arson. And yet they blame arson, climate yes. change. It's amazing. It's insane. And it's also government lands. Compare that to the you know, fires on privately owned lands, timber companies that you won't find anywhere near the same rates because the government for years, remember Smokey the Bear? If you want to blame any wildfires on anyone, Smokey the Bear. You know, the idea is you just leave the forest pristine, not clear cut, not allow any fires at all. And then you get all the heavy overgrowth. So the second you get a lightning strike or an arsonist, as you mentioned, you end up with wildly big fires. Nothing to do with climate, has to do with bad public policy. And they are coming around. Even California now is recognizing that that policy of old growth and virgin forests and not disturbing them is a horrible idea because it allows the forest to overgrow and then, of course, you have massive fires. So uh, in terms of what to do about it, I think we accept our servitude and we, like medieval serfs, we accept our fate. No, I'm kidding. That's not true. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, we are actually are fighting back. I wish Donald Trump were sharper on this. I wish J.D. Vance were sharper on this. Uh, you know who's really good on a lot of the things I just mentioned is RFK Jr., at least on key components of all this. His position on, I interviewed RFK Jr. in 2014, New York City Climate March. At that point, before he was red-pilled on climate, he told me that the CEOs of energy companies belong at The Hague with other war criminals, three square meals, and a cot. He said the skeptical politicians should be punished by the government. Fast forward, he's now apologizing for saying that. I, I've made my whole video available. His campaign actually reached out to me, wanted the whole interview, and they, he basically apologized for what he said, said he wouldn't say that today. But his new position on climate is, I won't talk about climate because climate change has been hijacked by the World Economic Forum and the United Nations for totalitarian control of society. So the first thing we have to do is awareness of the public. Second thing is fighting back. And we are fighting back. State attorney generals, certain governors like Ron DeSantis and others, are and, uh, and these attorney generals and states are fighting back against central bank digital currency. They're fighting back against environment, social governance. They're fighting back 
the corporate government collusion. You have credit cards led by MasterCard with partnership with Visa and now, I'm sorry, with uh, the United Nations having cards that monitor your carbon footprint and cut off your ability to spend when you hit your max. Now, if we get a central bank digital currency, the Bank of England said the quiet part out loud. They actually said this will allow you to only spend money on what the government deems sensible. Firearms, not sensible. Meat, not sensible. Gasoline, not sensible. Electric bill, not sensible. It's all got to be constrained by your carbon budget. This is literally the modern day Marxism of our day. There's no other way. It's, it's complete, total, totalitarian control of every aspect of your life to your stove, to what you eat, to your freedom of movement, to uh, your to even your control of your house, high, high def TVs. It's incredible. Everything is going to be monitored, metered. We have the LA Times saying that people shouldn't even be allowed to have air conditioners in their individual homes, that during hot days, they should have government cooling centers where a public bus picks you up and takes you to the cooling center. They actually did a, a, a LA Times uh, either columnist or editorial just last summer suggested this. I mean, this is totalitarian stuff. And again, it's all based on this crisis that we face, similar to the way we face the COVID crisis. This insanity, the problem is it, it began over three decades ago. It's been yeah. taught in all the public education centers. And now at the university level, they actually teach this junk science. Yes. Uh, and it creates mental health issues and psychoses. And how do we unbrainwash billions <laughs> of people? Well, the good news is you can. Uh, even if you look back at even say like the 1960s radical hippies and free love and all, a lot of those people grew up and they became actually you know the functioning members of society. They lost that idealism. I think that's happening now. And polling shows the biggest believers of this, as you mentioned, are kids who have been indoctrinated from kindergarten through college, right? And this is the Sunrise Movement, and these are the people the Extinction Rebellion recruit and the Just Stop Oil. As you get older, you get more and more skeptical. The most skeptical group of believers and of non-believers of a climate group are the older people, 60 and older. And that is because they've seen everything, they've heard everything, and it just loses its effect. So in a way, you have to let kids age out. Eventually, the, uh, the propaganda wears off for most of them or a lot of them. But I think we need to go to the root of this and stop uh, this nonsense from happening in the first place. And I guess the biggest thing we need to do, first off and foremost, and this is why it's in the Constitution, is we need freedom of speech. You've got to be able, kids' world today is social media. So the idea that other than Twitter, and even Twitter is kind of wonky with all sorts of algorithms and repression, and but these kids are being suppressed from even seeing a lot of these, uh, you know, any skeptical thought on this. But ultimately, you know, I think the kids are, so, they've overdone it so much with them that it's not sustainable, the propaganda levels that they have. And I'm hopeful that these kids, by the time they hit 30, will be growing out of the hysteria that they've been, that's been instilled in them. Yeah. The beautiful thing, a lot of my fans, uh, you know, we have almost a hundred thousand subs on Oppenheimer Ranch yeah. Project. They, they have their young children watch the show. So I had to kind of clean up the language a little bit. <laughs> and so it's literally, an, it's kind of a whole unindoctrinated homeschooling yeah. for them. Yeah. And that's what we're finding all over you, but you need, uh, you need these outlets. And here's the thing. You know, if Elon Musk walks away from Twitter, Kamala Harris gets reelected. You know, we are back to that whole, you know, U S government disinformation agency. We are back. You look at what's happening in the EU currently where they're talking about bouncing Twitter because they allow free speech. We've reached a point in 2024 America, where if you disagree with anything a government official has said or a government agency, you are by de facto a misinformer, disinformer, malinformer, and you deserve to be silenced, canceled, and, and censored. That is a frightening place. And what's even more frightening is that I'd say at least half the population supports that policy. And Europe is already much further along down that path. So the biggest thing we need is free speech and we need free speech absolutism. Even on my website, I remember people like, oh, you got a patrol. I'm like, no, it's the wild west. People want to make comments. Now you can get rid of ads and you can get rid of repeat or porno or whatever. But I believe in a complete free for all of exchange of ideas, even the trolls, because once you go down that path, uh, you can always come up with justifications like, oh, well, we have to get, we have to ban this person and ban that. I've never banned anyone on Twitter that I'm aware of even 
you know, all the spam I just delete. Uh, I just don't believe in that. And I've also never, I'm aware of, again, I may have deleted a tweet if I misspelled something and like I noticed it and there's no way to fix it, at least before you could edit it. But I, you know, uh, I, I've had never to delete anything because you, once you do that, you look guilty, number one. And number two, you don't, you can't really, uh, what's the word, hide anything uh, on the internet. So we need absolute free speech and Look what they've done to Donald Trump, trying to turn him into a criminal. And the fact that, you know, a commentator is not serious when they say, well, Donald Trump's a convicted felon. It's like, OK, yeah, that's frightening. You know, so that's like you're going to go to any banana republic and like this leader has been convicted. So he's no longer valid. I mean, we've reached that point where, you know, first of all, your kids shouldn't be in public school. If there's any way you can help it or the only reason they should be in public school is as a a way to toughen them up if you can't afford anything else or you don't want to do homeschooling as a way to toughen them up and turn them into, uh, you know, fighters in the public school. But otherwise, you just can't trust any public school, even in rural conservative areas, because the curriculum has been infected. I've testified at um, Common Core meetings and West Virginia and other places and, and, and talked about it. they want these standards in the books where they on climate in particular, there's no dissent among scientists. They all agree. We face a crisis and it's you know end times unless the government can take over and tax and regulate our well to a better climate, ourselves to a better climate. So should you and I, people like us, be worried that if the totalitarian socialist regime wins at the end of the year and they continue this globalist push, should we be worried that they're coming for us? We should be very worried. You have the, what's happening is everything, well, let's, let me see how to rephrase. Okay, this whole movement really, if you go back, you can talk about the Federal Reserve, 1913, you can talk about Woodrow Wilson's presidency. That's when this whole idea of the administrative state happened uh, in the United States. And Woodrow Wilson's advisors were telling him Again, this is late 1910, 1980, after World War I. They're telling them that this new system of the way we should govern is the, the unwashed masses aren't capable of taking care of themselves. We need rule by expertocracy. We'll have the best and brightest telling these people how to live, what they can do. And so by the time Roosevelt, he had a kitchen cabinet, socialist advisor, Stuart Chase, they, they were had an early version of the Green New Deal. They were talking openly about nationalizing energy, uh, censors, you know, basically abolishing free speech uh, and nationalizing agriculture, government control. They're very blunt in their language. And if you go to my website and to my book, The Great Reset, I explicitly lay all that out. So this has been a battle. Then, of course, you had people like George H.W. Bush who talked about the New World Order uh, back in 1991 was that speech. Everything really changed in America, accelerated with the September 11th terror attacks. The day after the disgusting administration of George W. Bush, Dick Cheney, decided to turn our t you know the air travel into a nightmare. They had the uh, we're still living under the emergency decree of 9/11. We have the surveillance state now, where Republicans voted for it. That should be the other thing. Not only breaking up Google, repeal the Patriot Act, abolish Homeland Security. I don't hear Donald Trump and JD Vance talking about it. Maybe they have. I missed it. It's not front and center. Instead, they're going after Kamala's race. Anyway. So what happened was under this biosecurity, the, the, the surveillance state that the Bush administration created got worse. And you had the bank collapse 2008, which then allowed all the equity asset to start buying up real estate and then higher you know, wealth disparity, if you will. And then, of course, COVID came along. COVID was just the acceleration of everything overnight. Emergency decree on COVID. Every governor could become a dictator overnight. Freedoms you never dreamt possible were imposed upon you because for your own good and for a crisis, medicine could be injected into your body against your will, or at least you could have your life ruined if you didn't have it. And we saw what happened with the Canadian truckers in Canada. You protest, you have the, your the government in the banks in collusion can deny you access to your own bank account. So that's where they are. The next step of this, by the way, is the WHO pandemic treaty, the WHO amendments. Biden administration wanted even more than the who wanted. This essentially means going forward, climate is now part of a public health threat. And then we have monkeypox, which is now mpox. Because And just remember, to understand monkeypox, take the K out or make the K silent and you got it. It's monkeypox. This whole thing, that's, it's odd that the solution to monkeypox is the same as climate. They're going to go after agriculture. They're going to start culling and killing cattle and pork and beef and chickens. Uh, and it's all a way to design for rationing food to soften us up, to eat insects, to soften us up, to eat lab-grown meat funded by Jeff Bezos, um, 
Richard Branson, Bill Gates. And the, the key to all of this is if this World Health Organization goes forward and again, if Kamala Harris is elected, they're all for it. Any Bill Gates funded scientist at the WHO, he's the largest single funded to the World Health Organization, can declare a pandemic. You could have global instant lockdowns, no outliers like Sweden and Florida this time. And they can issue stay at home orders, vaccine mandates, mask mandates, bans on interstate travel. This is our future if we allow it. And their ultimate goal is to make it so elections are meaningless. It won't matter who your congressman, senator, even president is. They'll all be beholden to this sort of super administrative state. So how can half the population be that stupid and go along with us? Part of, here's a shocking answer. I've been at this climate thing debate since the late 90s. Part of everything changed dramatically with Donald Trump's election. It's not to blame Trump, but they were so appalled that one of the uniparty did not get elected. And I never understood Republicans. I have a lot of criticism. You read my book, Great Reset. I talk about how Trump destroyed his own presidency by going along with Anthony Fauci, by going for Operation Warp yep. Speed, by allowing the COVID lockdowns, by allowing the what you know two weeks to flatten the curve. But what happened in 2016 when Trump was elected, the, media, the, the Uniparty and the establishment and academia and corporate America decided we can never allow another Trump to happen. That's when everything began in earnest with the censorship, with the shutting down of free speech, with going after, with our weaponizing the intelligence agencies. Again, these had all been there. And of course, 9-11 enhanced a lot of it. But this accelerated all of that process. So, um, so what's happening now is with uh, all of that weaponization of everything, we're at a point now where the only candidate at this point is Donald Trump. If RFK's rumor is going to drop out and endorse yeah. Trump, that would be fascinating. I'd like to see RFK in charge of CDC or FDA. RFK is phenomenal on free speech, public health. Uh, those are his two biggest issues in my mind. And anything Trump does with him in that department you, is be a win-win. And the fact that the media hates him is even better. So, uh, you know, it, this is... This is our battle at the moment. And again, if you look back at Trump, I could never understand in 2016 Republicans like, oh, I can't believe this. I'm a never. Okay, you had since Ronald Reagan, George H.W. Bush, Bob Dole, George W. Bush, John McCain, and Mitt Romney. You're telling me that you don't like Donald Trump? You can take that other lot of names I just mentioned and toss them into the shit can. Sorry for all the kids watching. But that is the, <laughs> that's the reality. Going forward, there was like almost no one. Ron DeSantis, I'm iffy on. He did a lot of stuff on COVID. He does a lot of stuff against the woke, but I don't know about it. I don't know if I trust his foreign policy. Number one, I think he's a yeah, uniparty globalist. Vivek Ramaswamy talks a great game. Outside of DeSantis and Ramaswamy, you know, I'm sorry, Nikki Haley, Tim Scott, Marco Rubio, um, the governor of North Dakota, whose name's failing me. What's his name? Uh, uh, Bergham. Bergen. He was a former Microsoft executive, worked with Bill Gates. Bill Gates gave him his first donation to his campaign. He's praised Bill Gates as a great humanitarian. I believe that if he had been picked as VP, which was very close, by the way, that Bill Gates would have had and the deep state would have had a, a, a you know, Manchurian candidate inside the Trump White House if he should win. And I don't think I think it's very hard for Trump to win. They, whatever the way, they'll find a way. It won't be the same as last time, the same kind of voter fraud anyway. They'll find a way. They're not going to allow Donald Trump to win. Uh, and I think that's the that's the scary part. So we have to win. He has to win in like overwhelming numbers in order to actually win. And we'll see what happens. Uh, uh, and I think this is the key. And after, I'm just saying the bench isn't that deep. J.D. Vance, I like a lot, but big donor, his whole equity asset firm is finance all funded by the uh, eBay billionaire who also works with the Google billionaire. I, I just have some distrust of who JD Vance is and where he came from. And I don't like those candidates hand chosen by billionaires. who make a lot of money in the private sector and then enter politics. So I don't mean to throw a rain. I don't know if you guys are, you know, your audience is all like rah, rah Trump, but I'm just giving you reality here that, you know, this is, this some worrisome thing. I do think Trump himself is very good but he's only one man and he couldn't even order withdrawal of Afghanistan when he was president and other things. Yeah. The military wouldn't allow him. They wouldn't follow the commander in chief's orders. And he couldn't, a lot of things he couldn't do. And I, I detail that in my book on the climate policy. He wanted to have a skeptical climate uh, group of scientists, like two dozen of UN scientists, former UN and Nobel prize winning and NASA and MIT. And he approved it, but people like Larry Kudlow who personally bragged to me that he stopped it, 
uh, because he didn't think it would look good for Trump to be challenging the consensus on climate. Uh, We had a a Princeton physicist who was working with Trump as his top science advisor. It was approved, this committee, would have been the first government pushback of any government in the world against the UN climate report of prestigious scientists. And Donald Trump said, I thought I approved that. And the staff's like, oh, yeah, but we're going to wait till after the election. They just slow walked it. And then, of course, he never was reelected. So even though Trump is not part of the Uniparty, even though Trump has a lot of great instincts, he is battling his own administration. It remains to be seen how much he's learned and who he appoints. But it's the appointing people as thin pickings in Washington because they're all from Republican and Democrat uh, administrations. It's a Uniparty first. Yeah, it's 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 a sad state uh, that our country is in now. My my partner and I we've discussed uh, what will happen if it's impossible to stop the globalists from taking over the world, and we came to the conclusion that there's going to be a breakaway group, an anti group that does not go into the smart cities or does not comply with this uh, digital currency which is why for 10 years we've been homesteading out here. We've got our own farm, yeah. orchards, animals yeah. um, to be sustainable. So, you know, if the power goes off, we, we don't care. We're not going to starve to death. Exactly. I mean, we've all seen the Mad Max movies. We've all seen the dystopian movies. You've all seen the Hunger Games. It's actually a very good, <laughs> actually a relatively realistic vision of how this could play out in a way. You have the ruling class elite, with all the wealth and then you have this sort of it's a new it's a neo-feudal system is what they're describing and you're absolutely right in order to survive it you have to adopt this attitude we're not quite at the point yet but we're rapidly approaching um and i think this is the you know because this is not even the fears of 100 years ago because now they have technology now they have um a modern infrastructure and monopolies in place where they don't need to jail you they don't need to harm you. They don't need uh, prisons with barbed wire and watchtowers like they did in old to impose tyranny. They can deperson you. They can make it so you can't go to a store. They can make it so you can't spend your own money. They can make it so you're a literally a canceled individual in your own world. They can depower your car now with all this OBD2, you know, the onboard diagnostic, the computers on cars, certainly with electrics. There's a whole movement to get Elon Musk to deactivate all the Teslas in Russia when Putin invaded uh, Ukraine. So the technology is frightening and there. And this is, you know, this is where we have to, you know, if we have to fight it on giving the government any kind of power like this. So I think one of the first things we need to do is just like a 10 point plan. And no one's doing it. I mean, not even Trump grants, but like a 10 point plan to break up monopolies, to de-weaponize the uh, intelligence agency, to, um, and, and most importantly, to just you know, break up all this emergency power that the government wields, 9-11, COVID. We need massive emergency power reform because that's the way the World Economic Forum just last week, or actually within a couple of days, announced that it's going to be a chaotic uh, 2024, 25. The more chaos in, uh, and in havoc they can create in society, the more you can have these emergencies where you have to suspend temporarily the civil rights, just like we had in COVID. And the only reason, COVID, like the mask mandate, look at that. That was done by the CDC, completely unconstitutional. But it took almost two years for one Trump federally appointed judge to overrule it. And all those two years, we all had to suffer on planes, trains, automobiles with a mask. I remember being on a Delta Airlines flight. Stewardess is coming by. You must lift your mask in between bites or in between uh, sips of your drink. Put your mask back on. You can remove it. Take a bite. They would tell you this over and over. They'd come around. And if you're eating, even when you're eating, telling you this, it all depended on whatever little tyrant felt empowered that day. But that was no constitutional authority, no election, no democracy. That's the kind of stuff that we have to reform. Never again can we allow that. And that's why I don't know. I haven't heard Trump even talk about reform emergency power. I feel like we're putting too much hope in this election. I feel like this is a longer term battle that, you know, that you know, we have to, we have to educate these candidates. And so we'll see where this goes, but it's a long battle. I'm not an alarmist saying that, you know, it's over if we, if Trump loses, but I'm also not a, a realist saying, you know, Trump can only probably get done 10% of what needs to be done if he's elected. And then the next election will probably reverse all that and go the other direction, even more than the 10% he reversed it. Yeah. Do you foresee uh, some surprises coming up before the election, perhaps with the MPOX 
or lockdowns yeah. or any of that? Well, they're certainly trying. Mpox is that's linking and uh, that's lurking in the background. What the World Health Organization, they've got it all set up. Uh, and there's all these articles in the mainstream media, how we weren't prepared. Everything about when you ever see an article, we weren't prepared. Just to say, what do they mean by that? Look at what Bill Gates said on multiple occasions. If you want to know how to handle the next viral outbreak, whether it's monkeypox, a COVID-like virus, look at what Australia did. He can't say China because that's even now, that's even still a little too far. Look at what Australia, we have to follow what Australia did. Australia next to China and Canada close had the most authoritarian response to COVID than any other of the West, so-called Western democracies. They had the uh, viral camp set up. They had track and trace apps. If you, um, you know, were at a grocery store the next day, you can get an alert or government official saying you were next to someone who later tested positive. You could either quarantine at home for two weeks or we're going to forcibly send you to a camp. You had the, the police and military uh, forcing people off of outdoor beaches in Australia. You had some of the strictest vaccine mandates in Australia. You had this censorship. People, you think it's unique that people in England are getting arrested for Facebook pace. That was happening years ago in Australia. And guess who the number one funder of the World Health Organization thinks did the best job of COVID? Australia. Bill Gates thinks that. So that is what we're dealing with. That's what they say. So I think monkeypox is a very serious threat. And they're talking about mass killing of lots of farm animals, which is, again, that's what Ireland proposed and Europe has proposed to do with climate. It's amazing how monkeypox solution is the same as solving climate change. It doesn't take a genius to figure all this out. One last point. If you go to my website, I have a, a 45 minute speech I gave to a conference, a huge conference of hundreds of people in uh, Vienna, Austria in June. And in that, I show you how the mainstream media and corporate America, corporate, global corporate, every international institution, academia, all the global press and our government institutions are saying the quiet parts out loud. Nothing I've said to you today is based on anonymous sources, secret documents uh, or anything that's, you know, uh, you know I, I can't reveal my source. Everything's out in the open. They say all the quiet parts out loud. I document this in my book, The Great Reset. But importantly, in my speech uh, and my Great Reset speech, I actually put up screenshots of all the mainstream sources. You can see the BBC talking about it's not a question of if, but when we have a flying free world, at least for us, the masses. And of course, that's already started, by the way. You have France banning flights at two and a half hours or less in 2023 with proposals EU wide. I mean, it's a question whether they'll get away with it, but this is what they need. They just need some more crises and emergencies. And in my book, I detail 1917 Russian revolution. You had Vladimir Lenin slogan was the worse, the better. In other words, create as much chaos, make society as ungovernable as possible, because that's how you can impose authoritarian totalitarianism on a society during that chaos. And that's why they want the chaos. That's why you want defund the police. That's why you want cities burning to the ground. That's why you want viral fears, climate fears. That's why you want terrorism fears. Uh, and that's the other thing I would just add. Don't believe your government. Anyone talks about classified documents. I don't want to curse because you guys said you have kids watching, but that is the biggest you know, I come from a uh, uh, security background uh, back in the 1990s, had high level sec you know, secret, top secret clearance, not secret clearance. And I can just tell you right now, they have weaponized our intelligence agencies so much to that extent uh, that they're going to be able to they can now you know, they'll, they'll be able to tell us. You know, we, we can't tell you, you know, we can't show you the details, but you got to trust us because we're your trusted government institutions frightening stuff. This is the world in which we face. We have to resist at every level. Positive note to end on is that the school board, lowest level of politics, angry parents at school boards helped topple, and I detail this in my book, The Great Reset, toppled the mask mandates and vaccine mandates in every major city in the United States by the parents standing up to the school board and showing that resistance. And then the election, particularly in the Virginia, where the, the governor who ran, Governor Youngkin in Virginia, ran against all of those mandates against the Democratic Party establishment. That so spooked the Democrats. The New York Times, and I detail this in my book, reported the Democrats did focus groups and realized that the vaccine mandates and mask mandates in the cities were even getting tiresome for their own base. And because of those elections spurred on by the angry parents at the lowest level of politics, the school board, they almost overnight, every major city from Baltimore, Washington, New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, San Francisco, Philadelphia, Seattle, lifted all of those mandates. 
And that's how the power of the people at even low levels of politics can have massive change in, a, in public policy. Yeah. So listen to Mark and get out there. Nothing changes unless you do something. It takes action. Resistance. Don't and resist everything. All of this, you have to resist. Buy extra meat. Drive your gas. Don't allow the gas power. The gas power car bans are unbelievable. That I live in a state of Virginia where even our own Republican governor can't get out of it because we have a Democrat legislator and our state decided to follow California. So it's like it's just imposed upon us. I mean, it's incredible stuff. Mark, it's been a pleasure talking to you. We're going to link all your books below. Hopefully we can have you back on the show and keep up the good fight. Thank you, Diamond. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. It's been a pleasure.